Le Cauchemar de Lula, Lula's Nightmare, a monologue from my new play, Welcome to the Jungle of Calais, Bienvenue à la Jungle de Calais, a play which is also included in the new anthology about refugees, entitled Voices on the Move, an anthology by and about refugees, edited by Dominica Radulescu and Roxana Kazan. Le village est là. Le village est loin, très loin. Non, le village est tout près, il est là. No, it's far away. The village is far. I'm telling you, it's close. How much water? A little bit. There is still some water left. We'll get there soon. The water, the village, the sand, l'eau, le village, le sable. We'll get there before dark. The village is close, very close. My flax is... My flask is empty. Ma bouteille est vide. On va arriver à la mer bientôt. Non, c'est la mer de sable. Non, c'est la mer de la mer, de la vraie mer. Je te dis, mon ami. There is no sea nearby, only the sand sea, only sand waves. You misunderstood, my dear. There is no sea, water sea. Only sand seas, waves of sand. The oasis, the village with the oasis is nearby. Drink the water. There is more. I have more, Lula. There is plenty of water in my flask. Trust me. La nuit tombe. Il fait froid. C'est bien. J'aime le froid. Lève-toi. 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 Le village est là. Please get up. You're just tired. The village is close. A sandstorm. On ne voit rien. The heat, I can't see a thing. The cold, I can't see a thing. The cold sand under my hands. This hole is too shallow. It's too cold. It's only a shallow grave, a cold, shallow grave. It's only a makeshift grave. You can't have a real grave in the desert. It's just for now. We'll come later with people from the village. We'll give you a proper burial later. The village is near. Le village est là. Your bottle is empty. You lied to me. I drank the last drop. Why did you let me drink the last drop of water? In the morning, when it's not too hot, not too cold, I'll come back with water and water your grave. Le village est là. J'arrive au village. Il n'y a personne. Qu'est-ce que je fais maintenant que je suis dans le village? « Raconte-nous ton histoire, » dit quelqu'un. « Quelle histoire Je n'ai pas d'histoire. »« Si, si, tu as une histoire, avec ton ami dans le désert. »« The camp counselor asks me to tell her my story. »« She insists I tell her my story. »« I have no story, I say. »« What story are you talking about ?»« When I got to the village at night, and my friend was dead and buried, the village was dark. » Everybody must have died there too. Or they didn't want to talk to foreigners. I never went back to rebury her. Yes, yes, I understand, but tell us your story, she kept saying. We need to hear your story. I have no story. Je n'ai pas d'histoire. I should have been dead. It should have been me. She would have made a deeper grave for me and she would have returned to water my grave. Je n'ai pas d'histoire. J'aurais dû être morte. Je suis plus, plus morte que vivante, je dis à la conseillère. Non, tu es plus vivante que morte. En effet, tu es vivante, tu es là. I'm more dead than alive, I tell the counselor in the camp. Leave me alone, I say, I'm more dead than alive. She says, she says, you're wrong. You're much more alive than dead. In fact, you're alive. You're here. The girl in the dream, the girl who got lost from the Crown Diaries 2020. Where are you coming from? From the water. Were you drowning? I don't think so, or maybe I was, but I saved myself. Are you me? I'm not you. Or maybe all right, I'm a version of you. 
Were you drowning? You already asked that. What is it like to be drowning? I am not drowning, I just told you. Do you remember home? What home? Home where you were born, where you grew up. How was it? Remind me. Are you old now? I'm not sure. It depends on the perspective. How was I when we lived at home? You didn't like being a child. It felt like a mistake. You always wanted to be old, well older, this age, this period of your life. Maybe I didn't like it then, but now I miss it. How was I? Tell me about myself then. I need you to bring that back to me, whether I liked it or not. You were a moody child. You were always missing something. Of course, I was missing me at this age. Was I happy? You wanted to be. Where was my mother? You always clung to your mother. You cried when she left you in school. You cried when she left you in kindergarten. You cried when she left you with a lady who taught French. So I cried a lot. Did I ever drown? You almost drowned once, but you saved yourself. You swallowed a lot of water. You walked across the city carrying your swim stuff. You were six and walked five kilometers across the busy city. She was waiting in line in some agency. She saw you in the window. That was stupid of you to cross the city on your own. What got into you anyways? Was I courageous? I guess you could call it that, courageous or careless. It's not the same thing. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Why do you have to speak in riddles? It's not riddles, you're riddles. Are we speaking a different language? Different from what? Different from the language you were speaking when I almost drowned and I walked across the city to where I knew my mother was because I knew she was there. In my dreams, I always lose her or she loses me, but she didn't lose me that day. Is it cold where you are? Yes, it's cold. It's foreign. It's far. It's empty. Do you like it? It's not about liking it. I chose it and now I have to stick with it. No, you don't. You can unchoose it. How do you unchoose when you have already made all your choices? You're speaking too abstractly for me. Another day she lost me in a deli store. It was in the time when the stores had food. They were happy times. See, you had happy times as a child too. How did you lose her? I said she lost me. It doesn't matter who lost who. You were lost from each other. They were terrifying moments. There was a huge mound of red caviar. I was drowning in red caviar. It looked like blood. It could have been blood. But you found your mother in the end. She found me. Did anybody help you find her? Maybe. A man who saw me crying asked me where my mother was. I cried and I said, I don't know where my mother is. Then she appeared. It was like I made her appear when I mentioned her. She was beautiful when she appeared. She was wearing my favorite dress of hers, a taffeta dress with pink and gray roses. It was like I saw her for the first time that day. Who has ever heard of gray roses? The gray roses on her dress were luscious. Where is she now? She's far in a big city, but it's a cold city like all the cities around here. We're all far away from something original in a faraway country. Everything is far away now. She's far away inside a faraway apartment, inside a faraway city. We can't touch each other anymore, and that makes everything far away. It's good you didn't drown that day, though, and you found your mother. You'll find her again. She's waiting for you. She's wearing a pretty dress with gray roses. She's wearing the taffeta dress with the big roses. Gray roses are better than red roses. Gray is the new red in the story of you and your mother, only better. Why better? Because it's like water and you know everything about traveling through water without drowning. Water is like air for you. If you saved yourself from drowning once, you'll never drown again. It's a fact. Goodbye now. When are you coming back? I'm not. You'll manage on your own.
Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of Romanian Women Voices of North America. I am Mihaela Moskaliuk, and I will um, start the reading with a poem for my mother, who, um, whose story is in many ways a classical immigrant story. And the poem Alien Resident is from my most recent collection, Immigrant Model. The eager beaver in the poem is a dildo. My mother rescues bitter cherries off Queens Boulevard. She catches and hoists them in the neck of her pleated skirt, cradles them to her employer's kitchenette. On a leather bar stool that spins into night, she pits and pits, keeps pace with the vermicular fanfare, bit of blood on the nails, petite castanets cackling in the dry mouth. On the trenches of dawn, crushed flesh dissolves in the sugar bath as she nods on one elbow to the squills of bedroom doors. She spoons coffee, keeping count aloud and pours milk for kids' pancakes as instructed with a measuring cup. The perfect scale of her eyes, she wastes on homespun sanitizers, two-third vinegar, one-third peroxide, the sinks, counters, her eager beaver, his dumbbells. She jogs through the day in bark slippers, Elm embossed with perfectly knived parts. What's she doing here, my mother, in a toddler cot? Apron pockets lined with shriveled fruit worms, jars of preserve ticking under the mattress like hand grenades. And I will continue with some new poems. Um, and these are part of a new manuscript, a book called Cemetery Inc, I-N-K, that is coming out um, in the spring with uh, University of Pittsburgh Press. So this poem is in memory of Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, um, George Floyd. And some information is taken from an essay by Sarah Lasko called Protect Your Library, The Medieval Way with Horrifying Book Curses. Empathy Test, May 25th, 2020. I did not expect to ace it, but was convinced I'd pass. Based not on well-earned moral ground, but thanks to wiring the circuits my spine, the charge at the slightest mention of wounds, or at the sight of beggars and fallen drunks, or almost as easily in the vortex of another's happiness. Still recently, I've diminished into imagining harm, assembling torments, researching spells, seeking the counsel of my goats, parroting the arsenal of hexes. When the, pres when the president's malevolence breaks the news again, I inhabit the middle age scribe, hunchbacked by virtue of his work at a table lit only by natural light, as candles endanger the pages. Eyesight failing, by virtue of this work, nerves pinched, viscera squeezed by virtue of a work unfinished until has slipped into the frontispiece, that last self-assigned calligraphic curse. Cleft by demon swords, eyes gouged out, devoured by hellfires, be the one tempted to desecrate this spine. And this um, next poem is dedicated to 
Lenutsa, Alina, Yorgu, Nikolai, Ramona, you know who you are. Um, these are all friends who grew up in the orphanage system in Northern Romania. Um, incredible people who keep me real um, and remind me on a daily basis um, what really what really matters. And this poem was occasioned by a recent return to Romania and a re reunion of sorts. Americana. At Arca lui Noie, under a walnut tree that guards our pack's rowdiness for three hours, above cheese turning fondue on the picnic table, Lenuza rolls back, sleeves, flexes arms, Arches brows invites me to touch. A wow, she bends with laughter. The other girls, orphanage pals, hoot affectionately, but nudge her to hurry up so they can perform the skit they've adapted from a reality show in which parents reunite with abandoned children. Once more, Lenuza beckons in full Popeye pose. A riddle lost on me, though I'm the testimony she calls upon when she needs an ark. From tomboy who bit volunteers and punched holes in walls to buttonhole puncher in coat factory. Woman who won't keep a man because no man she could have would ever quit violence. She spares her surviving son what anger she can others and hers. Mad hedgehog in mom's biceps, a boy nods, mad with pounding doors and walls instead of pounding me. I turn around for the girl's comedy. Daughters interrogate imaginary mothers, acquit them of monstrous crimes, indict them for fashion for pa. After we clap and whistle for encore, Lenitza whispers, you're getting so easy to fool. Night shift women rope my arms to the bed frame. How can you not tell strength from strangled muscle? Oh, my Americana, what did they do to you? And another poem um, written in Yash upon um, this recent visit. The homeless women of Yash. So many shouting at no one, disputing accusations, nodding maniacally, flogging trees with headscarves. Their pantomimes repopulate sidewalks with ousted ghosts. They pose no threat, but we detour cautiously afraid their siren voices might awaken the penal colony in our rib cage. And one, one more poem. Um, this is Self as Goat in Tree. I love goats. I'm a goat. And um, that's how it all started. But then I was also reading this article about the economics of Argan oil, um, how increased demand has benefited Moroccan communities and especially um, women, but how it has also posed significant concerns about forest sustainability and other eco concerns. Um, and um, also um, issues that have to do with animal exploitation. So the poem is not resolving anything. Um, it's being the goat, the poem itself. So self is goat in tree. Nine goats scamper up the gnarly argon tree and graze it clean. They ingested the wrinkled fruit whole though it's the bitter pulp alone that rouses their appetite for more. Sated, they stare at the horizon till branches wear thin and fall. 
farmers harvest goats and droppings to extract the pit rich in kernels of oil. Haven't you too wished yourself a goat? Perched punch drunk on a linden tree? Blase about the shit, the gold you might ship? How it might serve both hunger and greed? Haven't you goaded yourself to balance just a bit longer? Chew on some fugitive scents to get what a ditch the earth is. Thank you very much.